Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk on two of my favorite subjects on automated testing, test room development. Uh, my name is Oliver Davis, um, OP Davis everywhere, pretty much online, including Drupal.org. Um, the slides of this are already online if you want to look at them uh, as we go or later on. Uh, the second half is quite code heavy, um, so it's there if anybody wants to look at it later on. Uh, I'm a software developer, uh, I'm a full stack development consultant, and I'm an open source maintainer. Um, so I develop and I consult on a lot of Drupal projects for clients. Uh, my day job is using Drupal. Uh, and I maintain quite a few uh, Drupal modules and themes. So I've got quite an interesting perspective on this coming, from it, coming at it from a few different, uh, few different angles. So this is a screenshot of quite an old tweet. Uh, this is from Tim Millwood. This is February 2012, which seems like a, well, it is a long time ago, which <laughs> I realized the other day. Um, and this says, does anybody want to maintain or comment in this module could override node options? I said yes, and then in 2012, uh, I became a maintainer of this module. Uh, so this is how the project page looked back then, the UC stats looked like. Uh, it was used on just over 9,000 sites back then. Uh, there was Drupal 5, 6, and 7 versions, I believe. Uh, and then currently looking at the page a couple of days ago, um, it's currently used on just over 38,000 websites, which is quite a lot of websites. Um, a lot of them are obviously Drupal 8 and Drupal 9, but also if you look at the um, over the complete, sorry, the overall um, installations across all the projects, it's coming on 173, which out of about 50,000 modules and bad at all. <clears throat> um, so there were some existing tests um, I took over this module, uh, and those are really critical to prevent regressions as I'm doing new releases and bug fixes and refactors of this module. So why write tests? Uh, peace of mind, uh, I don't want to break 38,000 websites when I do an update. Um, sure, you guys don't want that either. Um, but also, I don't want to prevent regressions either in the module or in client code, my own projects as well. Uh, I want to be able to, prov to pr catch bugs earlier. So if I can find a bug in a test and fix it there, rather than it going on to production and then having a client find it or have a fail in a CI pipeline or something, I want to be able to fix it right there and then, and tests allow me to do that. Usually during TDD, you write less code. You only write enough code to make your test pass. Tests are there to tell you when to stop. If you don't have tests, you're not doing TDD, then you'll just carry on writing code and you'll end up with a lot of code you maybe don't need. Uh, it acts as documentation. So normal documentation in markdown files or Word documents or whatever can become out of date and be stale. Uh, tests can't do that because you run them very, very regularly, and if something comes out of date, then the test will fail. Uh, the Drupal core requirement, so if you want to contribute something to Drupal core, you need to have a test with it. Uh, and this is just more important as Drupal core is speeding up. As we know, we get new releases now, every big releases every 12 months. Uh, modules support multiple versions. Uh, the current uh, override and options module supports 8, 9, and 10 in the same version. Uh, and this is just going to become even more important as we hear about automatic updates and core updating by itself. So a little bit of history of testing uh, in Drupal. In Drupal 7, we had a simple test module uh, that was completed as part of core. Uh, when Drupal 8 started, we then added uh, PHP unit, which is really the, the de facto testing framework in PHP. Um, it still is. Uh, we also have PEST these days, which is very popular, but I still think PHP unit is sort of still the default and the de facto version. Uh, it then became the default for us uh, in Drupal 8 and then 9, and then in 9, just simple test is gone. Uh, it's in Contrib. You can still install it if you want to, but it's more there's a transitional thing to move to PHP unit. So how do we write PHP unit tests for Drupal? Uh, everything is a, te each test is a test class. Um, they obviously have a PHP.php extension. Uh, you have tests per module, so if each module has its own test directory, you're not writing tests at a project, at an at a application level, uh, you're writing them per module. Uh, there's a separate Drupal slash tests namespace, so if you're used to using some Drupal slash your module name, you'll do the same just with tests before it. Uh, and then because of PSR for autoloading, uh, the class name must match the file name, uh, the namespace must, must match your directory structure, and one test class per feature. So very same, similar to writing uh, controllers and the other classes that use PSR4. Okay, click the slide, brilliant. 
Um, so there's three parts to a test. Uh, we have arrange, act, assert. So first of all, we set up what we need to make our test work. Uh, we then perform some sort of action, and then we make assertions based on it. So given we've got these things, this thing happened, does our site now look like this? You can also mirror this to given when then. People used to think so user stories and acceptance criteria you've got given uh, I'm logged in as this user, when I do this thing, then that should happen. Okay. Some things to test. Here's some examples from projects I've sort of worked on before. Um, tracing nodes with data from an API. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, calculating attendance figures for an event. Uh, we built an e-commerce site where the product was uh, the event and people were attended by buying a place on it. Uh, so we calculated attendees by who bought the product. Uh, determining if an event is purchasable, same project with date ranges and if it was full and things, you might not always be able to purchase a place on an event. Uh, promotions and coupons for new users. If you sign up, you get two free coupons to go on an event or to do something. I'm uh, going to clone events. So this is a very event uh, driven project actually. Um, we're going to clone events, so we want to have one event and then we want to duplicate it again the next month or the next year or something. Uh, we want to send private messages to attendees. Uh, so we did that by using a private message module. So we wanted to queue them because some of these events had a lot of attendees on them. So we want to queue them so we don't overload our web server and send 500 e private messages in one go. Uh, this is another old tweet. Um, this is from uh, Matt Stauffer, or the tweet of Matt Stauffer's quote, uh, which I liked. Uh, Test the thing that you lose your job before if it breaks. So I want to have confidence that you know, if I'm finishing at the end of the day or if I'm going on leave for a week, or I'm finishing a project, or uh, I'm pushing an override and options update, I don't want to worry about uh, everything, <laughs> everything breaking. All comes down to this sort of confidence and being able to be happy that things and work as expected. Okay, so what does the test look like? As we said, it's a, it's a PHP class, because we're doing PHP and tests. Uh, it's in our Drupal test namespace. Uh, we're going to use, in this case, a, a browser test-based class. So there's a number of these different types of tests we can use in Drupal, and there's various base classes we can extend. So this one's browser test-based. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and then we've got a test method. So it's a function or a method within our class that we can, that we can do. So this one just says test something, and then uh, we're going to make an assertion that false is true, which is obviously going to fail. So very similar to our normal, like, that's how you'd write a normal PHP class in you know, a controller or whatever. Not too dissimilar. Uh, there's different ways of writing these test methods. Um, you could use the sort of camel case sort of suggested way of start. Everything needs to start with the word test to begin with. So we can test something as in uppercase S something. Um, a convention is to use snake cases for camel names, uh, snake cases for test names. Um, <laughs> snake for camel names. Snake case for test names, uh, just because it's more readable. Um, I quite like this convention. I use it quite a lot. Uh, and then you can also drop the test prefix to get, uh, completely and use an annotation. So at test comment. So usually I'll use the third of these options, but you'll see different variations of it uh, in different projects. As I said, there's different types of tests. So it's not just unit tests we have available to us, which is a common thing. People think it's just unit testing. It's not. Um, we have at least four different types of Drupal that we can use. Uh, functional tests, which are also called web tests, browser tests, feature tests. Uh, which actually make tests against endpoints and check in the results and things. So make sure you're actually looking at the responses you're getting from your code. Uh, we can run kernel tests, which is also integration level tests, and then unit tests, which is what we'd expect for testing logic and things. So functional test, test end-to-end -end functionality. So you can say, go to this page, get the, uh, do we get the right response code? Do we have the right text return back? Uh, does, does the right, does this match? The HTML that we expect to get back. So it's very user interface sort of level testing, um, which yeah, interacts with our database. So we're not mocking anything in this time. We're actually using a real database. Uh, this could be like a MySQL database or an SQLite database that's separate to your normal database. So you don't have to worry about your things being deleted when you do a, when you run a test. Uh, it's a complete Drupal installation behind the scenes. You can test your profile. So your data is safe. Um, because they're doing all this behind the scenes, they're a bit slower to run because they have to do all this setup and all this bootstrapping behind the scenes. 
Uh, there's variations for running them with or without JavaScript. Integration tests are a level lower, uh, so we can test modules, we can test the test our service container, we can make sure our services run properly, we can do things against an actual database, so we're still using a real database for integration tests, for kernel tests. It's still doing a Drupal bootstrap, but it's doing a more minimal version of it. So it means we've got a bit more setups to do to get them to run, but they are faster because this, it's going to do less for us out of the box. Uh, the new testing, so this is very PHP logic level testing. This is the typical sort of calculator thing. I put two plus two equals four, that type of logic. So not testing service containers or databases, but testing very small uh, isolated bits of logic. These are super fast to run because they're just testing let's say, logic things. They're not really touching, there's no database. We can't do anything with a database. If you're gonna need a database, you need to mock everything. So you're saying this is a, a fake version of this thing that we need to use. On the downside, they can become quite tightly coupled because you're sort of mocking everything. Um, sometimes you can literally just end up testing your mocks. And I've done this before. And I've written the whole thing and then gone, but I'm just testing what that mock does. I'm not actually getting any value from this test at all. Uh, and if you write very tightly coupled tests, they can be difficult to refactor. So you can write tests that say, this thing gets called three times and returns this. If you refactor that later on, it might not return it three times or it might not get called three times anymore. It still works, but your test is going to fail because you've been very, very specific on how it works. So how do you run the test? There is a, a run test or sh script in core. Um, I very ever really use it, but it's there. Uh, so it's sort of a wrapper around some of the underlying sort of commands that we can run. So uh, it's a PHP file, even though it's a .sh file, but so you can run it with PHP um, file name. Uh, and there's different flags we can pass to it, like all of them run all your tests. You might want to run the test within a specific module uh, or within a certain class. Um, we can specify that as part of that. Um, here's an example. This is one I'm doing uh, in one of my Docker examples or on GitHub. Um, specifying we want to run tests within an example module. Uh, we're going to use an SQL Lite database. So we're going to put the SQL, da SQL Lite database in this file, so that's where it can run quickly. Uh, and then because it's Docker-based environment, uh, you also tell it where our um, web server is. So we can make requests and then look at them and get it back. So because it's on Docker, it's not all in localhost. They're all named differently based on the service name. So this one's called web. Uh, that that has to fail. So here's an example. If I run that, this is what we'd see. Uh, we can just run, this is running against the uh, example module project. Um, so we can run this example page test. We can see when it ran, um, then we get a little summary at the end. So we can see what tests it ran and, where, and very importantly, whether they failed or not. So this one passes, so I hope it would. Uh, usually I'll just run the PHP unit executable itself. So I need to specify still the simple test base, a simple test base URL variable that tells it where our site is. Um, so I need to set that first, and then I can call the uh, vendor bin PHP uh, unit executable. Um, there's a PHP unit XML file in call in the call folder. So I do specify dash C, which just tells it where our configuration file is, and then any pass, uh, pass the test we want to run. And we see something, something similar. Um, you can see the, what it's run. We get a little dot, whether it's passed. Uh, if it fails, you get an F. If it's an error, you get an E. But if it passes, you get a little dot. It's not just things on the screen. Uh, and again, we'll see how many tests it ran and how many passed and how many failed. Uh, so we can create our own PHP unit XML file. As I said, there is one in call that we can use. Uh, and it's just a file that configures how PHP unit runs. Uh, so we can copy the one out of core. Uh, we've got an XML.dist file, which is our sort of default version, our standard version and we can then copy it to make changes to it as we want to. So this is a very Drupal core focused um, slide. Uh, if I was doing this on an actual sort of application or for, for a project, I'd make my own version of this file in the root of the uh, project and make my changes to it there. But this is a, a very core example. So things we want to change uh, are base URL again. So it might be local host. On a Docker example, it might be web or whatever your container is named. Um, we need to give it our database. 
So it could be a MySQL database. It could be the same database as your application is using with a different prefix. Um, I like to use an SQLite database. And then it just get, creates it, populates it, throws it away afterwards. And if you're doing functional tests, you can now have it save the code uh, and screen, uh, sorry, the screenshots of what it did and save them in a file uh, in a directory called browser test output directory. So you can actually go back and see them afterwards, which is really helpful for debugging. Uh, something else I use quite a lot is stop on failure and set that to true. So whenever a test fails, it just stops. So rather than running all the rest of the tests, uh, I just want to know there and then that something failed. So an example. <clears throat> so on a project um, a few years ago, actually, we had to do an integration with this service called Broadbean. Uh, it's a recruitment management solution. People post job adverts and things on it. Um, and one of the things the client wanted us to do was have those job ads appear on the website as well as the other places they had them. So our spec was we wanted to create, they wanted to create jobs in uh, their, the, the UI and we wanted them say, to appear in Drupal uh, on the website. Uh, the application URL is something that came into us. So they would apply through, through another system, sort of the middle, the middle part of this equation. Uh, we take the domain, we take the role ID they were required, that they were, uh, that they'd set, and then there's some other parameters and things like where the job would come from, etc. And jobs were linked to offices, uh, so they passed through, tell us which office it was located in as well. Uh, and there was a certain number of days that this job was active for. Uh, they also wanted to specify the path. So it'd be like, you know, mysite.com slash something. Um, they'd pass us that as well. So this is how it looked. We had uh, the Broadbean stuff on the left. They sent us some XML. Um, we made a, a, an endpoint, a webhook endpoint available, and they would post the data there. In Drupal, uh, we would do our stuff there, create the node, people would click it. They would then see the application URL, click it, make their application uh, in the, the CRM. So, uh, yeah, as I said, so we made a route um, that allowed us to accept data from uh, XML. Uh, we added a system user, so just a, reg a Drupal user that only had access to do this one thing, just to keep things nice and secure. Uh, they'd give us an active for date, which was the amount of time, the number of days it had to be uh, visible for. And we got the branch name, the locations, they'd send us what is plain text and XML, and we would link them to entity reference because we had offices as a content type as well. And then the URA is that they'd pass us, we'd map that to the, uh, the path. So this is what the data coming in looked like um, in a sort of a PHP array. So we, we got it from XML, we made it into a PHP array, first of all. Uh, we can see we've got a command, first of all, that says whether we're adding or deleting the job advert. Um, they give us the, some of the like, username and a password, uh, the number of days, uh, some details, so the details will become the body, uh, the job title will become the no title, etc. Um, yeah, and if there was no error, we created the job. We then gave our sort of 200 OK response back to Broadbean, so they knew it worked OK. Um, if there was an error in some description, then we returned an error code and a message we gave from that. So they were able to give some feedback to the user at the end as well. So how did we use different types of tests for this? Um, functional tests, first of all. Uh, so we made sure that our job nodes we created and created with the right URL. We got the correct response code back from them. Uh, we then used some JavaScript tests, um, the application URL, we had to update the JavaScript because reasons. Um, there was something to do with UTM parameters, I think, that they didn't, they worked locally, but then as soon as you put them like UTM source on the hosting provider, it didn't work. So we had ended up having to do it with JavaScript. Um, actually wasn't the best, uh, best solution, but when I had the tests, I was quite happy that it worked. So uh, that was a nice, nice benefit. Uh, we need kernel tests to make sure that the job nodes added and deleted as expected. Uh, the, once they expired, they deleted, uh, and then also made sure that our application URL was generated correctly based from the number of pieces we had to make it from. And then we used community tests to make sure the number of days were converted to timestamps correctly because we'd be using the timestamps. Uh, some results, uh, we had no bugs. Everything worked as expected, it was brilliant. Um, there was some debugging time, so there were some queries that like it did stop working at one point, but it's easy for us to go, well, as long as you're sending us the data in this format, it will work because we've got tests and the tests are passing. So if you're not sending us the data in the right format, then it's going to break potentially, which is what happened. 
Um, but it's actually really quick for us to debug this because rather than us going through the whole module and then sort of debugging everything, it, um, we could just lead on our tests and say yeah, everything from our side is still working. So again, send us data in this format, please. So test-driven development. Uh, so we really talk about automated testing uh, as its own thing. Um, TDD is its own separate thing. Um, it's just the workflow of writing a failing test first. So we start with the test. This can be quite scary to, <laughs> to begin with. It was for me, I'm sure it is for everybody. Uh, you sort of want to write the code first because that's what you're used to doing and then sort of write the test afterwards. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. But with TDD, you write the, the failing test first and you want to see it fail. Uh, then you write enough code to the test to pass. Then you want to do any refactoring that you want to do whilst things are passing. And then you just go through that cycle again. So you maybe add some more assertions or maybe move on to the next test afterwards. Uh, so it's commonly called red, green refactor. So red is when things are failing, green is when they're passing. Uh, and then you could do uh, or red, green, blue, I've also heard it described as. Unfortunately, my slides are not going to be red and green, unfortunately. Um, it's also the approach I use when I was porting modules to Drupal, to Drupal 8, including the node optional module. Um, so I used to make a branch and then move, add some, move the tests across first, look at the failures, make them pass, and that's how I, how, how I did that. So very TDD-ish workflow. Give me a really hand test. So I like to write tests outside in. So I like to start with the top level, I like to start with the functional tests, see how those work first. They're probably the easiest to set up and probably the most valuable. Like, does our endpoint work? Do we get the right response code that we need? And then when I need to, I'll drop down the level and I'll do integration tests or unit tests. Uh, if there's maybe something that doesn't work in a browser, then maybe I'll, I'll drop down to integration test level. It depends based on what you're testing and what you need. I like to think of programmer wishful thinking. Um, you write the code you wish you had and then the tests will tell you why it doesn't work and then you write a bit of it to work and then over time your test will be green and then you know it works. Um, in my tests, I like to write comments first usually. So just to sort of spec things out. Usually again in that given when then or arrange act assert phase and then fill the code in afterwards. Just as gives me, keep, helps keep me on track. And so usually I like to, sometimes I like to write assertions first. I'll start with the bottom of the test and then work my way up. I'll say that you know, I expect this thing to be one and it'll go, well, you don't have a variable called articles. I'll go, oh yeah, I don't have a variable called articles. I will write the variable articles and work my way up. So the opposite of this is obviously uh, inside out testing. You start from unit tests to work way up, but I prefer this approach. Uh, here's a project I'm working on at the moment. And this is uh, the count of the number of tests I've got. So um, another thing, I have mentioned is if you put them in, uh, organize them in the correct directories, you can then call them using different test suites. So I can just say run the functional tests, run the kernel tests. So that's what I did on this project. And I've got a, a count of the numbers and things that we've got out. So on this project, I've got 57 functional tests and there's 180 assertions in there. Uh, I've got 38 kernel tests and then five unit tests. So if you imagine that, um, the other approach we get is a, a, a testing trophy. So it's wide at the bottom and works its way up in that sort of pyramid sort of fashion. Um, I'm doing the opposite. So I've got more tests on the top and working my way down. Uh, I run these in a CI pipeline on every push uh, using GitHub Actions and they run in about two to three minutes. So we've got a demo. Um, I'm not going to code it all, unfortunately, just because of time. Um, it's, a, it's a short and simplified example. Um, I've done a longer version of this before. Um, probably something I'd probably use views for in, in an actual real situation. I just make a console type and do this with views. But for this example, I'm going to we'll go down the sort of the custom code route and see how this how this work. So if you think I'll accept this criteria, um, as a visitor, I want to see a list of articles or blog posts, a page, so slash blog, and I want to see them sorted by the post date, uh, the most recent blog post at the top, working our way down. So my tasks are, I want to make sure that the blog page exists. Uh, I want to make sure that only published articles are shown. And I want to ensure that they're shown in the correct order. So, uh, so we can start by scaffolding out the test. So this is a start, we'll do this outside in. And we'll start with the, the functional feature test first. So we'll just scaffold that out. 
Um, this is in uh, the functional namespace again. Um, I like to group the functional tests, uh, everything grouped first of all by type. And then if there's like subdirectories, I'll usually mirror the subdirectory structure down there as well. Uh, there's a couple of default things we need to pass. One is the default theme. I think as of Drupal 9 something, we need to start to define the default theme as well. Uh, I've had tests that fail because you change the theme and the markup is slightly different. Um, Stark seems to be a good starting place for me anyway. Um, and then here I'm just gonna, this is part of my, just my scaffolding. I've got an uh, empty modules array. We'll see that in a minute. And then we can write a test. So I can say that uh, we expect, oh, uh, it loads the blog page. Okay, we'll use that sort of snake case uh, type name with the annotation. Um, I think it's fine with test code and I changed my PHP CS file to say it's fine on tests. Um, so we're going to use this function called Drupal get. So that's going to go to the page or to the URL that we specified get the actual request back, or the response back, and then we can do assertions against it. So we can say that, first of all, we want it to return a 200 response, we want it to return an OK response. So it's a TDD, so we haven't written it yet. So what's gonna happen? All right, it's gonna fail. So this is an example of what we'll see. We've got a big E at the top, so we've got an error, okay, because the page doesn't exist. And about halfway down the slide here, we can see current response status is 404, uh, as in the blog page doesn't exist, right? So we haven't created it yet. But we're saying we want to get a 200 response code. So we want the page to exist. So again, we usually get this little stack trace of, of what's happened, what's called what at the bottom. Uh, and then at the bottom, we get uh, the number of tests, the number of assertions, and everything at the bottom. Nice little summary at the bottom and errors in capital letters, which is nice. So again, uh, usually I'd use use for this, but for this example, we'll do it the custom coding way. Uh, we'll make a routing file and we'll call this blog.page and we'll say available at this path slash blog, which matches our criteria. Uh, we'll specify the controller that we want to use. So this will be in our DrupalCon module uh, in the controller directory, and we call it blog page controller. Uh, I'm not specifying a method name, so we'll use an invocable um, controller. It's just my preference. Uh, we'll give it a title and then some requirements. So we need to build to access content to see this page. So we run it again, and maybe we think now that's going to work, or at least we're going to get a different message or a different error, but we don't. Um, in our test, we don't know that the node module, uh, the, sorry, that the uh, spoilers, we don't know the DrupalCon module is not enabled. So in our modules directory, we just say we're going to enable the DrupalCon module. If you think about your so Drupal websites and project and, and the whole application, I'm worried about saying the word project, but I think Drupal project in the Drupal.org sense is a module or a theme. So if you think about uploading it to Drupal.org, then it's not going to know which modules and things you've got on your project. So we can just specify them. So once we've done that, uh, we say enable the DrupalCon module, enable our module that we're making, uh, our error is going to change. So we're making progress. This is this TDD workflow that you have a failing test, you then make the error change, and then you keep going. So now our response code are, uh, has changed. So now we're getting a 403, well enough to a 200. So we've gone from a 404 to a 403. Uh, but we're still, still, still wrong, so we still get the failure. So we need to enable the node module in this case. Um, let's just see here. Yeah, because of this permit, if I go back a couple of slides, we've got um, the requirements permission of access content, which is, which is given to us by the node module. So we need to enable the node module. So once again, our status code has changed. So we're now getting a 500 error code. So something's broken, but at least the page exists now, nearly. Um, so we need a controller. So we've told it we're gonna, that you need to go to this controller and then go to the, uh, the vocal class and then that's what we're going to use. We haven't created it yet, again, because we're doing TDD. So we haven't created our controller. So, no. so that's the next step is to make our controller. And we're going to make the smallest controller possible to get our test to pass. So let's make invocable. So we use the global underscore underscore invoke. And we don't need to return an array because it's, we're going to return a render array. So we'll just return back an empty array. And that's enough to get our test to pass. So we're getting our correct response code now. So we're getting our 200. So that's a good first step, I think. So the next part is we either look to refactor. It's not really anything to refactor at the moment, um, but we'll keep adding more assertions. So we know we're getting the right code. What we don't know yet is whether we're getting the right H1, the right page title, or the right text on the page. This will fail, um, and we can make some changes to our block, which controls to make this work. 
So we can get it, instead of just turning back an empty array, we'll say hash markup and return back the text that we want, make that work. And the title will be set in the root, so that'll be fine. And again, our test passes. So again, imagine this is green, right? Usually it's be green in the internal output, but not in slides, unfortunately. So we know the page works, but now we need to make sure we've got content on it. So I'm going to use a repository pattern for the, use the repository pattern for this. So I'll make an article repository. So in my test, this is going to be an entity um, a kernel test base. So this is a kernel test, an integration test. But again, there's a number of different classes that we can use. So entity kernel test base extends the normal kernel test base. I found for a long time when I was writing on this particular project anyway, um, kernel test base, I'd have to do the same setup steps every time. And then I found the entity kernel test base that did it all for me, which was made my test a lot smaller. So I'm going to say, um, so we're going to test a class called article repository. Again, the convention is, it's the class you're testing with the word test at the end of it. Um, it returns blog posts, and we're going to get our repository out of the container. First of all, so we can use this container, uh, which is given to us by the, the class we're extending. Uh, we're going to try and get our article repository, and we're going to say get all, and then we're going to assert the count. So we want one thing back. Again, usually I do this over a couple of steps. I'm squeezing things in because of slides and time. So we're expecting one thing. Uh, this kind. So just enough of a, just enough of a test to make it fail for us to, to make. So first of all, we haven't we specified that we're going to use this article repository class, but we haven't made it yet. So we're getting an error that we're saying that it's saying um, service not found except. So service not found exception is getting thrown because we're trying to call something that doesn't exist. So if we make it, uh, this will be in our, in our repository directory and call it article repository. Again, the smallest thing we can do, the simplest thing we can do to get our test to pass is just to make, in this case, an empty controller, an empty repository. And because we're making it a service, we need to add it to our services file for our module. So I like to do services in this way. I just use the full um, test name, the namespace, and everything for it. And again, it's just a squiggly uh, tilde at the end. Again, it's not something on the slides, on the screen. So again, our error has changed. So we've said we've it said we didn't have an article repository. Now we do. So the next error is that we don't have a get all method on it. So let's add a get all method. So again, we're going to want to have it return back an array. So let's just return back an empty array. And now we're at a point where we're actually getting sort of like a logic failure. We're not getting a setup failure where the class you're calling doesn't exist. We're now failing, like our assertion is failing now. Like where you said we want one thing back and we're getting zero back. So I'm going to uh, inject the entity type manager interface uh, into our class. We can use nice PHP 8 promoted constructors. Um, we get the node storage, and in our get all, we can now just say return this storage load multiple. Again, like this isn't going to work as we get to the other use cases. And so we've got other node types, for example, um, then it's going to return them all. But for this test, it's going to it work. So again, what's the simplest, smallest thing that we can do to get our test to pass? Uh, and because we're injecting something to our constructor now, we're going to just enable auto wiring, which is another talk on its own. Um, otherwise, you could specify arguments and pass through each argument separately. So this will just inject what we're asking for into our class. So again, we get this message, node any type doesn't exist, because we're, even though we're trying to create nodes. So we'll enable it in our modules array. Again, the same as we did before. Now we're back to the situation again where zero matches one. So in our test, we also have um, this thing called a node creation trait. So it's a trait where there's lots of methods on for creating nodes, as the name sort of implies. Uh, and in there, we can say this create node, and we can specify an array of things. Because again, like it's, if you open this on Drupal.org, it's not going to know about the, the content on your site, because it's, it's, it's a completely separate standalone module. So you need to create this content within your tests for it to, for it to work and make assertions against. So before we do anything, we're going to create a node. So that's our, this is our arrange step at the top of the, in the, first, the first third of our test. Then our act is we're going to get our repository and get all the things, and then we're going to say do our assertion at the end. So now we've got an article. We've created an article. Our test passes. So again, it's just a constant sort of red, green refactor, this fail, little pass refactor phase that we're doing. 
Again, now we're green, we can keep building. So we can either, in this case, we just add some more assertions, I think. So uh, we know we get one thing back, but is it the right thing? So we can make sure it's, uh, we can it's an object, first of all, rather than you know, a string or something else completely. Um, the index key one, because we're getting them back from the type manager, so they are actually, it's not a typo, honest. It is actually number one that comes back, it's node one that we've created. Um, so we're saying it's an object. So the first one we return back is an object. Um, but then we can say it's got to be a node. And then we can say it's got to have the correct node type. So it's got to be an article. Uh, we've set our title now upon line two. So we can then assert that the title is the correct title as well. So not only now are we getting things back from our repository, we can also make sure it's the right thing that we're getting back. So how do we make sure things are published? So everything we've done so far is we could have done really with the functional test. We can make sure the text is on a page or not. So we can also test this at our integration level. How do you make sure that the, only the published things are returned as per our criteria? We don't want to see our unpub unpublished things yet. So we can also set the status. We, in this case, we can just use the note that the constant for published or not published that's on the node. Uh, so this is just zero or one, isn't uh, it sets the status. Um, and we're going to say now, based on this test and based on our arranged steps, out of five nodes, we were expecting to see three. So we're assuming our count is going to be three. This is going to fail because we haven't written the code for this yet. We're still returning back everything. So we're saying we expect to get three, but we're getting five. So now we can go back and we can go back into our uh, node repository again. And we can update our get all method. So instead of saying load multiple, load everything, we can pass uh, this. Now we'll switch to using load by properties uh, and then we can use uh, set the status there, and just add a condition to our query. So now we only get back the published ones, so again, this passes. And then for our sorting, how do we fix that? Now, this is a real one. Like how, for the functional test, we could say we see this text on the screen. What we can't really do very easily is say it's this is first and then that is next and this is that. Like, I'm sure we could do. Or we could look at XPath or something. But this is going to be a much easier way to test it. So this time we can set the created date. And let's set them all to have different created dates, right? So they're going to get what we get now by default, which isn't what we want. So let's set them. And let's set them in an order we know is going to fail because we want to see the test fail first. It's a little bit of an anti-pattern to be like, yes, our test failed for, uh, past first time. Uh, you need to see it fail first. You know it's testing the right thing. Because if, if I put them in the right order, they would just, it would just pass and it would work. But it's not actually, it doesn't actually work the way we expect at all. So the order I've put these in, it needs to be uh, three, then one, then two, then five, then four. Okay, this is going to fail. So we're setting them minus two, minus one week, minus one hour, minus a year, minus a month. So we expect them to be in that order if we're sorting them in the way that we've said that we want to, the way our criteria says we should. So as we expect, I guess, now our test is going to fail. It says, certain the two arrays are equal. So we'll just go back a bit. So on line 15 here, we're saying the the same. So we're getting the node IDs that we return back and then saying we expect them to be in this exact order. We're not saying look at our page and so, so we want this H1 and then this and then this and that, and that order. We're literally looking at the IDs we're getting back from our code. So it's returning them back to, oh, it's not returning them back as 31254, it's returning them back as 12345, right, in the right order. So this is failing, right? Because it's not matching our, our, expected, our expected order. So let's go back in and we can make an update. So we can still get our articles from our repository. Uh, then we can sort them. So we can use the UA sort function of PHP. Might be a better way of doing this. And then we can pass the callable and we can say node A and node B. And then this created, uh, created time is greater than this created time. Since the last time I did this talk, um, you should be able to return back whether it was bigger or not as a Boolean. But now you've got to pass through as uh, an integer. So we get to use the cool spaceship operator as if whether it's less than or equal to or greater than, which I thought was really cool. Um, so yeah, once they're sorted, we return them back, our text passes. So there's a whole other layer to this as well. Like you can go drop down and do some unit testing. I've got uh, the longer version of this where I do like a presenter and that's like a, u a unit test and everything, but we'll do the, the simplified version of this, this talk. So this was a uh, tweet, I did this talk at uh, a user group in the UK uh, a while ago, when was this, 2018, goodness me. Um, <laughs> a screenshot that somebody had taken after this and said, I got this, uh, woo test, there we go, awesome, 20. 
There's a lot of old tweets in this slide, I've just realized. Um, so I tweeted that afterwards, and then someone's response back was this. Terrible quality photo. <laughs> but it told Drivey to test, and it was great so far. It's really helped me give me a peace of mind to help me uncover a bug I wouldn't have otherwise. And this is quite, like, the main thing is about this confidence, right? It's like, again, is, are things working the way you expect? And, and tests aren't going to tell you whether things work, but they're going to tell you whether things don't work. So there might be use cases you haven't tested yet that you haven't found or, or that you still need to write a test for. But if you've written a test for something and then later on you're changing it or you're refactoring something and you break it, you'll know because your test is now going to fail. And I think that's quite common why people don't like extending or changing code or don't refactor code very often because they're scared of breaking it. So if we can leverage these tests as a safety net and we can know that the test passed to begin with, I've made all my changes and it still passes, then we, things still work. Uh, we did a big refactor on, oh, not big, but a fairly large refactor on the overriding options module a while ago. And it was, yeah, we were able to do that because we had these tests in place. And that's how I started, actually. I started doing a, I wrote code during the day, so I started learning, and then I wrote tests in the evening for that code that I wrote. And I found a bug that I wouldn't have found otherwise. And that's what really got me hooked on testing. So thank you very much. There's some links here to like, uh, the PHP unit documentation things and the Drupal org documentation. Um, my site is oliverdavis.uk. Um, and then the last thank you, I'm going to be doing um, a free uh, seven day email uh, automated testing course for email. So you can go to slash ATTC, automated testing Drupal course, uh, put your email address in there. And I'm going to finish that this week, he says on camera. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> so yeah, get, and this will just go a bit more into this detail than what we've just seen. Uh, and we'll look at unit testing, we'll go a bit, we'll do the full breakdown of everything in that course. And that's um, inside of that for free in advance. So thank you very much.